Welcome once again to this week's online service from Beaconloft Baptist Church here in Gateshead. It's good to be back with you again. Spring is in the air, signs of new beginnings all around us. At the same time, our hearts break for all that is happening in the Ukraine. So as we gather today, wherever you are, I'd like us to start our time of worship with just a moment of quiet. Words here from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. On the same day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let's go over to the other side of the lake. And leaving the throng, they took him with them, just as he was, in the boat in which he was sitting. And other boats were with him. And a furious storm of wind of hurricane proportions arose, and the waves kept beating into the boat, so that it was already becoming filled. But he himself was in the stern of the boat, asleep on the leather cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Master, do you not care that we are perishing? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush now, be still. And the wind ceased sank to rest as if exhausted by its beating, and there was immediately a great calm, a perfect peacefulness. He said to them, Why are you so timid and fearful? How is it that you have no faith, no firmly relying trust? And they were filled with great awe and feared exceedingly, and said to one another, who then is this, that even wind and sea obey him? Let us come now into the presence of Almighty God, the God that even the wind and sea obeyed. Be still, my soul. Our God will undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Our hope, our confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, your best, your heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Peace. 
still my soul when dearest friends depart and all is dark and in the veil of tears then shall thou sorrow and thy fears. Be still, my soul, thy Jesus can repay from his own fullness all he takes away. Be still, my soul, the hour is hastening on. When we shall be forever with the Lord When disappointment, grief and fear are gone Sorrow for God, love's purest joys restored
As you know, I work for Premier Christian Radio in London and the last week all the stories have been dominated by what's been happening in Ukraine and us trying to tell the story from a Christian perspective. Mobile phones have made a huge difference to this in that people are able to film and send recordings out, they're able to make sound recordings uh, and they're also able to send uh, email messages. Uh, I got one on Friday. Um, you may have heard a little bit of this, but I thought I would share you the full unedited edited story. Uh, and this is from the YWAM team that are working in Ukraine on the ground. For the last three days, there's been a storm raging on the Black Sea. It's been so ferocious that Russians' naval ships have not been able to dock at port. Also, yesterday, my husband got a phone call from a maternity ward in a small town just outside Kyiv that had been destroyed from the bombing. The maternity ward was in desperate need of supplies and they gave him a list. He took the list, walked out of the door of our building and all of a sudden a truck pulled up outside. Out jumped a group of Norwegians who'd come over from the YWAM base in Romania. The van was full of humanitarian aid, including every item that was on the list for the maternity ward. He was able to direct the supplies to exactly where they were needed. The person who's written this email said that they were just talking to a colleague in Kyiv and they're feeding 150 people a day right now at their base. And they're talking about how eight kilos of macaroni miraculously fed 150 people. These stories are what has been lifting our spirits. It's the support and prayers of the body of Christ around the world that are making the difference. This is such a time as this, as mentioned in the Old Testament in Esther chapter 4 and verse 14. A moment for Russian and Ukrainian people, but really a moment for the whole world. And if you want to find out more uh, obviously, you can listen to Premier Christian Radio or you can go online to Premier Christian News. Let's sing together. Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm when the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn 
in the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are few, I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be. The sure and steady anchor While the tempest rages on When temptation claims the battle And it seems the night has won Deeper still then goes the anchor Though I justly stand As we face the wave of death When these trials give way to glory And we draw our final breath We will cross that great horizon Clouds behind and life secure And the calm will be the better for the storm that we know Christ the sure of our salvation ever faithful ever true we will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be We pray for the peace and justice for Ukraine, my Lord. Be there for Ukrainian people, my Lord. Bless them. Bless them in this horrible situation that is happening by now. Father, we also pray uh, for President Putin and other oligarchs and uh, his advisors and uh, people that he works with. Oh, my Lord, may they know that the justice will come. The justice will come from you. And may they think about it now, my Lord, mm -hmm. and change their minds and uh, um, stop harassing other people, my Lord. Father, uh, we pray about European community and uh, the whole world leaders, and we pray, Lord, um, bless them to make the right decisions in this horrible situation that is happening now. You are our refuge, my Lord, and we trust in you. I know lots of Ukrainian people do the same, my Lord. And uh, please, my Lord, uh, bless them, um, be with them. We pray in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Lord, we read in the, your word that you are the Lord of hosts, the captain of the heavenly army. Lord, so in this time when we see the powers of evil, because we believe they are the powers of evil, causing so much death and destruction in Ukraine, Lord, we pray for a, a miraculous intervention that the uh, invading armies may be repelled. Lord, we read in your word in the Old Testament about how 
uh, when your people were under attack, you miraculously intervened and that the enemy ran away. So Lord, we just pray that you will bring an end to this great strife, to the attacks that are being made on just ordinary civilians and that peace may reign. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we pray for Olina at this time, Lord, and her family, those who have gotten into Poland, and for those who are still uh, stuck in Kiev. Lord, we pray that you will be with them, be with Vera and Olina at this time as they uh, struggle with what's happening. We pray for the young men, Lord, and for the, the older fellows who are getting into the army to uh, help with their country. We pray, Lord, that you will bless them and keep them safe. And Lord, we pray that you will help us as a country, as a praying country, Lord, for the people who are out there, that, Lord, you will answer our prayers and that we will see this war come to an end because we ask it in your name. Amen. Our Father God, this situation is just beyond us, but we thank you that it's not hopeless because we can come to you at any time and at any place and bring our concerns to you. For the terrible images that we see on our TV screens, for the worry we feel and the angst that we feel because there's nothing much that we can physically do. We pray that you make us good stewards of our prayers, of our giving, of our willingness to help in any way at all possible. We think of all those that have been displaced and are running from home. We realise the sadness that is there and the fear that seems to motivate every single step of the way. We think of the mothers having to control children. For the children who have no idea and see this as some kind of great adventure and yet there's got to be a normality in all of this. And yet dad, brother, uncle are missing. And we pray for those who have been separated from their loved ones at this time, volunteering to fight, understanding the force that they're coming up against. We thank you for their defiance and their willingness to be bright and to hold out hope. But we pray as well in those quiet moments there will be a Christian, someone who can bring your word of life into that dark place. Again, we pray for world leaders as they have to deal with some big decisions. And we pray specifically uh, for the soul of President Putin this morning. We pray that you'd help him to understand that you've got a way as well as he's got a way. And that your way is best. But we pray too for the Western powers as well, who have made some very difficult and controversial decisions over the past years that have kind of brought a lot of this on. And we say, so we pray in our world politics that folk will begin to understand that there needs to be an integrity and an, a transparency that takes into account ordinary people and ordinary people's lives. We pray for the electorate worldwide, that you'd make us all responsible and good stewards of that opportunity to be able to vote and to have a voice for the right. Lord, there's so many working parts to this situation that we can't just grasp onto one and then understand the whole picture. But we thank you that you understand all of these things. And so in humility, we bring them before you this morning and ask that you'd hear our humble prayers. In Jesus' lovely name. Amen. Surely he has borne our griefs Carried our sorrow Yet we esteemed him stricken Smitten by God And afflicted But he was pierced for our transgressions 
was crushed for our iniquities Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace And with his wounds we are healed And with his wounds we are Turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was a prayer. With his wounds we are healed With his wounds we are healed Oh, we like sheep have gone astray We have turned everyone to his own Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. If you have your Bible with you, would you please turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, and we begin reading in, from verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognise the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognise the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. The story goes that a teacher sent home a letter to all the parents after the first day of school. And he wrote this, If you promise not to believe all that your child says goes on at school, I will promise not to believe all your child says goes on at home. It's amazing, isn't it, how we set the standards for what we will believe, and that's dependent on how we feel at the moment. Immediately, we hit a problem, because when it comes to life and truth in particular, our standards are clearly not God's standards. To depend on our own judgment is unreliable, because, well, we change like the wind. So let's read some verses from Isaiah and from Jeremiah to look at God's standard. Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and unto our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Then Jeremiah, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from the flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its root by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of doubt and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Your first heading this morning, the standards. Now, John here is concerned for the believers of his time. Many had started the path of faith so well and were beginning to slip the moorings and taking on board different philosophies of Greek and Roman mythology and fitting in those things and those thoughts around their Christian understanding. And instead of just sticking to the teaching based upon the experience of the apostles, they were, there were compromises, carnal and spiritual. And it was a kind of justifying everything by spiritualizing behavior. And you know the kind of thing we do all the time. We use phrases like, I felt led, or I laid a fleece, you know, everything out of context. And it all sounds pretty convincing, but it doesn't really stand up to much scrutiny. Well, folk only heard what they wanted to hear, and some were making a living from it. And so it's no wonder that John says, my dear friends, don't believe everything you hear. Carefully weigh and examine what people tell you. Now, everyone talks about God comes from God. There are a lot of lying preachers loose in the world. Now, I think John's being pretty fair here. He's calling the situation for what it is, and he's challenging sinful behaviour that is promoting self-gratification and presenting that as truth. Now, just in case we think he sounded a little bit self-righteous here, we have to bear in mind that the apostles had no reason to lie or to weaken the message that they preached. They understood the spiritual battle that was raging around them, and they could see the deliberate attack of the enemy that wanted to undermine the truth and put focus on the flesh and not on the facts of the gospel. The apostles, of course, had nothing to gain. If there was a motivation for anything, it would be to water down the truth of Jesus and the gospel so that they might be spared torture and being killed. Well, you know, that didn't happen. But John's not just calling the deceived out. He's encouraging us to engage brain and spirit together. You see, when we become Christians, we don't kiss our brains goodbye and hope for the best, because that's no hope at all. When Jesus saved us, it was mind, body and spirit. And we're meant to be wholesome creatures that think and act and evolve in righteousness. And this grants us the authority to live and discern the truth. Now, at this point, it would be easy for us to sit back and say, well, look, we've heard all this before. Today is a bit different and the issues are different. Wrong. The fact that humanity doesn't change means that the church has to apply sanctified common sense in a world that is spiralling out of control as we become more and more self-obsessed. From the Christian believer, consistency is demanded in line with Jesus' commitment to us, and it cost him everything. So let's look at an example. It's a fact that when it comes to politics, folk can be very, very particular. When it comes to buying a car, or maybe a new home, or even decorating that new home, the commitment to research is put in place and no expense is spared on our comfort. But if we compare that to the church and to Bible study, to prayer, to attendance at church, to giving, and being part of the decision-making within the community, too many just sit back and they go with the flow. 
This convenient Christianity is the undoing of the church and society as it compromises itself in the same self-indulgent way that was a problem in the early church. John says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test, and he means by that, carefully weigh and examine the spirits to see whether they are from God. Now the word test in Greek that is used here is the same word that metallurgists use when they're refining precious metals. So the application seems obvious to me that we must burn off everything which is not true, so only that which is of value remains. Now I'm aware that's a hard word, but it is one that challenges our priorities, challenges our comfortable religion and our lukewarm response to the needs around us as everything seems to be dependent on how we are served. So let's think about it. Doctrinal issues, ethical issues, understanding what God is saying to us and to the church is for us all. And it's not just for those who seem to love the detail. Too many folks are just wrapped up in their self-sufficiency and they're deceiving even themselves. They have this image in their minds of what they're really like and they're proud of that. But under the searchlight of the Spirit of God, it's obvious that they will not see the real state of affairs. So the main point here is that we need to get serious and we need to test everything that we are being taught that is based upon the Scriptures. This means that we, are, we have to grow up and we have to stop being naive in regard to the spiritual realm and the conflict that is raging around us, seeking to undo and even destroy the freedom that the gospel of Jesus brings. Faith and hope are not blind optimism. They're the qualities and the standard of a relationship with the divine. Now, I think it would be great to get into the weeds and find out what was going on amongst John's original readers, but we can't do that. Suffice it to say that many were yielding to the temptation to go back the way they came and modify their old reality rather than accept the full-blown challenges that come with trusting Jesus as their saviour. Now, it may have been persecution. It may have been clever words, but whatever it was, it encouraged folk to put the shackles back on so that they were influenced by their environment that appeared so all-powerful. But you know, in the spiritual realm, it held no power at all. Someone once said, faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. I've read this lovely story about Hudson Taylor going to China. He made the voyage on a sailing vessel. And as the vessel neared the channel between the southern Malay Peninsula and the island of Sumatra, the missionary heard an urgent knocking on his stateroom door. Well, he opened the door and there in all his glory stood the captain. Mr. Taylor, he said, we have no wind. We're drifting towards an island where people are, are heathen and I fear they're cannibals. Well, Hudson Taylor thought about it and said, well, what can I do? I understand you believe in God, said the captain. I want you to pray for wind. All right, said Taylor, I'll do that. But first of all, you must set the sail. Well, the captain looked at him and said, well, that's ridiculous. There's not even the slightest breeze. Besides, the sailors will think I'm mad. Well, finally, after Taylor's insistence, he agreed. 45 minutes later, the captain returned to the cabin and he found Hudson Taylor on his knees still praying. And he said these words. You can stop praying now. We've got more wind than we know what to do with. The point here is that in faith, we have to be discerning and we have to be diligent, working out our, our belief and faith in practical terms, rather than being passive and instinctive, waiting for life to come to us and then try to do what feels best. Wasn't it James who said this? Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shown its true colours. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so that you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get his help and won't be condescended to when you ask for it. Ask boldly, believing without a second thought. People who worry their prayers are like wind whip waves, don't think you're going to get anything from the master that way, adrift at sea, keeping all your options open. The standards. Secondly, the battle. 
The dangers that we face today are in some ways culturally different to those in the early church. In their environment, there was a widespread acceptance of the spiritual realm. There were beliefs and practices that were commonplace where gods and goddesses were worshipped, and myths and legends grew up about these figures, and they earthed them, and they worshipped them as demigods. Today, this takes different forms, but it's just as subtle in its deception. Clairvoyants, for example, operate freely among our population, offering the false hope of communication with the dead. Everything seems sincere, but dark forces are at work to undermine the life-giving words of Jesus, which require thought and action, and they replace them instead with temporary lies that keep folk trapped in their, trapped in their past, blinding them to the possibilities of the future. You know, it's a fact of what Paul says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The denial of this fact endorses the naivety we spoke of earlier. As believers, all of us at one time or another has experienced the temptation to compromise the standards of faith. And it seems that this is a reality of life. The question is, how will it affect our judgment? Now, this is the reality of warfare. Much of it is unseen, and that is the difficulty because we cannot in our own strength confront it directly. But, it, but its effects are felt and experienced as we reflect on life and we take a hard look at the society around us. Evil continues to affect the way that the world operates, and we as Christians, under the direction of God the Holy Spirit, are to combat it by standing firm on the truth of God's word, being willing to protest on, and or to make a stand on issues of morality and justice, for example. But none of this can happen unless we take up arms in the spiritual realm and unless we wear the right equipment for the task. Now, primarily, John, in his instruction to be discerning, is issuing a mandate to prayer. But he's assuring us that it's not just our words in praying that count, but our state of mind and our expression in attitude. This is what makes us the people that we are and enables us to see with a, a supernatural vision that lifts us above prejudice and warped thinking. And all of this finds its basis in a real living relationship with Jesus that trusts the truth that he brings without distraction, but with thought and, con and, and considered opinion. You know, Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat, I am. Don't run from suffering, embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? What could you ever trade for your soul for? Don't be in such a hurry to go into business for yourself. Before you know it, the Son of Man will arrive with all the splendour of his Father, accompanied by an army of angels. You'll get everything you've co you have coming to you, a personal gift. This isn't pie in the sky by and by. Some of you standing here are going to see it, see it take place. See the Son of Man in kingdom glory. Now, John is, picks up on the gospel, and it's making clear to us that all of this, the discernment of what we are being taught and by whom, the acceptance of the word that we receive from the beginning is an issue of discipleship. The very centre of our understanding and our purpose in life and our faith has got to be our Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship to him. It is our identity as disciples of Jesus that reveals the purpose of God the Father. And it's this that helps us to move with all confidence in the spiritual realm without thinking that it's spooky or weird or for someone else. If you don't know the battlefield, how do you know where to fight? You know, someone said, discernment in scripture is a skill that enables us to differentiate. It is the ability to see issues clearly. We desperately need to cultivate this spiritual skill that will enable us to know what's right from wrong. We must be prepared to distinguish light from darkness, truth from error, best from better, righteousness from unrighteousness, purity from defilement, and principles from pragmatics. So we start by recognising the need to put right our relationship with God 
and all that we need will fall into place. Remember Jesus' words, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. I love the way the message puts this. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. For, In his own words, Jesus gives us foundational guides so that we can be free from bondage of the world system and so that we can stand against the devil who inspires that very system and whose sole aim is to undo the work of God and take as many folk to hell as he can. What does John say? But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognise the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. There's a very practical way that we can be disciples and achieve the glory of God. We need to deny ourselves. Now this is not the same thing as self-denial as we would understand it in terms of Lent, for example. Any of us can practice self-denial in as much as we can hold back on our activity or food or anything that would stop us achieving our own goals, whatever they might be. Listen to what Jesus says in the Gospels again, this time from the NIV. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their own soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? This is the battle of our lives. We must deny ourselves ourselves the struggle over who or what is going to be God in our lives. And we must resist those that would encourage us to compromise the truth, no matter how attractive that might be. Now, I know that sounds really basic, but the reality is that all of us struggle. We just can't cope with the thought of anyone or anything else being in control of our being or our circumstances. And as a consequence, we're never really at peace, despite the outward appearance that everything is under control. It's important for us to know that we were never designed as human beings to function independently of God. So just as we cannot live free or at peace without God in our physical lives, Neither can we live freely in the spiritual realm without him. And herein lies a problem. All of us struggle with the power thing. to the point where we make up excuses. We design our methods and we operate deceiving even ourselves. The challenge is to test the spirits and to maintain our focus on the truth. Think about it. Every blessing. Thanks, Bob, for sharing with us this morning. If you'd like to speak with Bob, get in touch via the email address on the screen. Now, here's Irene with our time of prayer for the fellowship. Let's pray together. We come before you, Father, confident because you know us and you love us. And as we bring our thanks and praise to you, we also ask of you for these, our church family, who need you at this time. We pray for Dick and Lena, Phil's mum and dad. Dick was 90 this week, but is far from well and now has COVID. So we ask that you would be with this couple. Bless them, Lord, and keep them as Phil and Aileen seek to look after them. We pray for Sandra, Lord, who has been in hospital this week. Uh, She's now at home, but we ask that you would help her with her daily breathing difficulties. Just give her some rest and some peace. We continue to pray for Lena and Vera's family in the Ukraine and uh, we just pray that you would keep them safe and help the worry to uh, be be lessened as, as they trust in you. We pray, Lord, for Len Heppel, who uh, lost his wife Elsie this week after a long, brave fight. We just ask you to be with Len and his family as they grieve for Elsie 
and be with Brenda to us and, and all the input that she has with them. We just ask that you'd wrap this family in your arms of love, Lord. We remember Jimmy Barris and it was lovely to see him back in church last week. But uh, some hard decisions have got to be made regarding his uh, future care and particularly his happiness. So we ask that you would be with the family as they and Jim decide what's the best thing to do. Just guide them, Lord. We pray for our dear friend Dave Jackson. Uh, his elderly mum's had a fall recently resulting in a broken neck. So we ask that you would be close with her in her hospital bed and uh, just give her your love and your patience and your peace because the next few weeks she has to be very still. So we pray that you would just uh, be with her, Lord. And we uh, pray too for Ben and Val. Uh, we continue to bring their needs before you uh, physically and we just pray that you would uh, help each of them as they struggle sometimes and we just ask your blessing upon them. We pray too for Ian's mum, Thelma. She's uh, facing a back operation and we commit her and all the details of this uh, to your care. We just bless her, we ask. So Lord, we thank you for your loving care towards us, undeserved as it is. And we just pray that you would keep us in your strength and in your love. So we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Marvellous, wonderful, infinite God, author of all that is good, faithful provider and giver of life, source of all power and love. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, refuge of strength to the end, righteous redeemer and mighty to save. He's the anchor of hope for the souls of men. Wonderful, infinite God, author of all that is good, and faithful provider and giver of life, source of all power and love. God, radiant, holy delight, beautiful Father, victorious Son, source of unchangeable light. Shepherd who comes for the lost Rock of salvation, remarkable love Savior who died on the cross
I'd like to close now with these words from 2 Corinthians and chapter 1. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we're experiencing in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we'd received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He's delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favour granted us in answer to the prayers of many. And a closing blessing. Heavenly Father, God of mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to the embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. This coming week, keep us from faithless fears and worldly anxieties, that no clouds of this world may hide us from the light of your love. Help us to make the most of every precious moment. We pray all this in the name of the one who calmed the raging sea. Amen. Thanks for being with us today and I hope you'll join us again next week. Return you came to seek and find your cross life.